This is a uh, far less hostile environment than I was in yesterday. <coughs> the food industry sponsored uh, conference on sugar, <laughs> explaining all the benefits of sugar. And um, the good news is I didn't get arrested. <laughs> I did actually have Pete Evans on notice to post bail. <laughs> and it was quite an interesting event. And uh, the words cult came up on their slides, but I thought it was a bit more cultish. And I wanted, some of you may have seen my post this morning, you're all much, much better behaved. <laughs> so, I would like today to open your minds to an extra option in the management of cancer, something that can be done to make surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy more effective. I've had my own battle with cancer going back 15 years. This is my research. This is part of my journey. I also mentor the dietitians at the Nutrition for Life Centre in Launceston that encourage an LCHF lifestyle, low in sugar and carbohydrate and higher in healthy fats. The most dangerous phrase in the English language is we've always done it this way. What if the model of cancer that we believe in is actually wrong? We've been taught that cancer is a problem of chromosomal damage. And what if that chromosomal damage is just a marker of disease and not actually the cause? Today I'd like you to consider that the primary problem is one of glucose metabolism within mitochondria and that the chromosomal changes that we see and have been blaming as the cause may in fact just be the effect of a primary metabolic dysfunction. If so, this opens up a whole new way of managing cancer. So I'm going to blame the microscope back in the early part of the last century. I think it distracted us. We looked down the microscope and we saw chromosomal abnormalities within cell nuclei. And again, what if they're just there at the scene of the crime, but not to blame? So we know that getting rid of the firemen doesn't actually solve fires. It certainly doesn't prevent the next fire. So attacking chromosomal changes by destroying them with chemotherapy and radiotherapy doesn't solve cancer. It may treat it, but it doesn't take away the cause. This is a PET scan of a person filled with cancer. Multiple hotspots means multiple metastases. That's what kills you in cancer. It's not the primary, it's the secondary. PET scans are a measure of glucose metabolism. And virtually all cancers are positive to some degree on a PET scan. The more aggressive, the more positive the PET scan. What are the chances of multiple chromosomal abnormalities across multiple cancers all ending up with the one glucose metabolic pathway. Compare that to one abnormal glucose pathway firing off masses of oxygen free radicals and causing metab metabolic chromosomal abnormalities. Otto Warburg's been trying to tell us this since 1924. He was a contemporary of Einstein, a winner of the Nobel Prize in 1931 and for those biochemists amongst you, he taught Krebs the, of the Krebs cycle. Warburg showed that the problem in cancer cells was in the mitochondria, the engines of the cell. He knew that there was a defect in mitochondrial glucose metabolism, and he went to his deathbed in 1970 trying to tell us that. And I think most of us in the medical profession have ignored this common metabolic pathway of cancer. So if we can consider a metabolic model, then we have the potential to starve cancer. And nutritional ketosis may be an option. You've heard that term bantied around today, but nutritional ketosis is a lifestyle of reduced sugar and carbohydrate consumption. It's called a ketogenic diet. It's about not having an elevated blood glucose. It's about not having insulin spikes. It's, not, it's about not having insulin growth factor 1 spikes. I think nutritional ketosis is bad for cancer and I think it's protective of the cells around cancer. So what is the metabolic model of cancer? Well, it's based around energy and growth. Random chromosomal mutations are secondary. Now we're going to do a bit of biochemistry today and drift into a bit of science. All cells require an energy source of adenosine triphosphate, ATP, and they also require building materials that are either sourced locally or transported in. 
normal cells convert glucose primarily into ATP and a little into maintenance. However, cancer cells do the opposite. There's a diversion of glucose away from ATP production to the building materials required for cell growth. Glucose is transported in massive amounts. That's the Warburg effect and that's the PET scan. The other building materials require a protein and fatty acids and cancer steals those from its surroundings. That invasion of surrounding tissue accounts for how cancer spreads and how cancer then metastasizes and how cancer eventually kills us. And that's called the reverse Warburg effect. And the driving force behind all of this is oxygen free radical production. I believe that those oxygen free radicals then cause the DNA, DNA damage in a random fashion and then account for our chromosomal abnormalities. So if we can find the source of the oxygen free radicals, we might be onto something. Inflammation drives oxygen free radical production. Now if we can work out then what's behind inflammation, then we may, we may just be able to unlock cancer. I believe the modern diet is inflammatory. That's another whole presentation. It's on YouTube, well and truly available. I believe that the combination of sugar, particularly fructose, refined carbohydrate and polyunsaturated oils is highly inflammatory. It produces a mass of oxygen-free radicals. And that oxygen-free radical production may in fact be the cause of cancer. So if we consider this model, then we have new treatment options. We can direct our treatment at the causes of the damage and not at the chromosomal replication. I think this makes sense. The pieces come together with the metabolic concept. So what doesn't make sense to me is the current chromosomal model of cancer. So what we're going to do is look at the flaws in that chromosomal model. Most cancer incidence is increasing, particularly in the developing world that has adopted Western food. Many cancers have multiple mutations. 5% actually have none. That's odd. How can you have cancer without a chromosomal abnormality? Only 10% are familial. Most are random presentations. Genome mapping hasn't sorted this out in the last 20 years. And radiotherapy and chemotherapy are treatments aimed at the damaged chromosomes and not the cause of those mutations. Now, Thomas Seafried from Boston has put some seminal work together on this and he got some normal cells and he got them to duplicate, that makes sense. He got cancer cells to duplicate, he got more cancer cells. But then he added tumour nuclei to normal cells but didn't get cancer. But when he added normal nuclei to the tumour cytoplasm, he got cancer cells. And it seems in the simplest way that the cytoplasm is the problem and not the nucleus. And this actually pushes us away from the genetic model. We also know that there's DNA damage in cancer. We know that oxygen-free radicals are involved, but unfortunately most researchers have not been looking at where the oxygen-free radicals have come from. And I think we need to look harder at that. If so, that proposes an alternate model of cancer based around energy and growth pathways, and we're going to work through that evidence. So what observations can we make? We are getting fatter and sicker than ever. Our rates of cancer are increasing. One in two men are going to be affected by cancer in their lives. One in three women. There's forecast to be a 70% increase in the amount of cancer, particularly in developing nations in the next 20 years. Ch children's cancer is increasing 3% per annum. The introduction of Western food to native populations has seen the introduction of Western cancer. There's an increased incidence and poorer prognosis with obesity. The same goes for those with diabetes. What about a mechanism? Again, a bit of biochemistry. All cells require fuel. And the mitochondria, that green thing there, is where fuel is turned into energy. Acetyl-CoA is the primary chemical involved. And it can be sourced from glucose, which then is then converted to pyruvate. Or the other source is ketone bodies from our fat intake, and ketone bodies are critical to this ongoing presentation. ATP is produced in the mitochondria from that acetyl-CoA. They don't mind where the acid, where the, whether it comes from glucose or ketone bodies. 
So again, in normal cells, fuel is mostly turned efficiently into energy, into ATP, and a little into building materials. But in cancer cells, it's the opposite. The majority of fuel is diverted, and cancer focuses on growth rather than energy. And there is a diversion of glucose away from ATP production. Here's the interesting thing. Cancer, mitochondria, don't metabolise ketone bodies. They are very dependent on glucose, and that glucose comes from sugar and carbohydrate and what the liver produces from gluconeogenesis. That's the disrupted metabolic pathway. And that's the Warburg effect again, the fermentation of glucose by aerobic glycolysis. Here we go, normal cell. Glucose is converted to pyruvate, and this produces about 36 ATP. That whole process is under the direct influence of insulin and insulin growth factor 1, which is directly related again to how much carbohydrate and protein we eat. Now in a cancer cell, only about 5% of pyruvate enters the mitochondria, produces about four molecules of ATP, and the majority of that pyruvate is converted then into lactate. That lactate is then diverted into phospholipid production, which makes up cell membranes, mitochondrial membranes, and the ribose 5-phosphate of the DNA backbone. Again, all of this is under the insulin, effective inf influence of insulin and IGF-1, and again, that's primarily related to how much sugar and carbohydrate we, ate, we eat. Again, cancer cells need glucose. They cannot use ketone bodies as a fuel source. However, the surrounding cells of a cancer can use ketone bodies, and I think that's protective. This creates options for us. We could decrease the amount of glucose available by cutting out sugar and carbohydrate in our diet. That will also decrease the amount of insulin and IGF-1 that we produce, and that means less stimulation of cancer growth. So what does a cancer cell require to grow? It needs fuel in the form of glucose, but it also requires those building materials. It requires protein, fatty acids, phosphate and acetate. These, however, are not readily available in the circulation. They need to be stolen from the surrounding cells. That local tissue invasion allows the cancer cells to steal those building materials. That's called the reverse Warburg effect. So how does a cancer cell do it? Well, again, it's that same aerobic glycolysis as the Warburg effect. It is glucose dependent again, yet it's called the reverse Warburg effect. It was about a 50-year, 60-year time frame in the description between the two. It's all based on hydrogen peroxide generation, and that's caused by oxygen-free radical interaction with the water in the surrounding tissue. There's a specific action on a thing called a fibroblast. Hydrogen peroxide breaks down the fibroblast cell and releases the materials required. That local tissue invasion is implicated in the process of metastasis. So cancer gets its building materials by foul means or fair. The Warburg effect gives us the glucose, and the reverse Warburg effect gives us the rest of the building materials by invading the fibroblast cells around the cancer. Hydrogen peroxide is the way cancer does the local damage. Oxygen-free radicals are there again. They are the trigger that create havoc and disrupt pathways. Again, inflammation drives oxygen-free radical production. The modern diet is inflammatory. It produces a mass of oxygen-free radicals. And here's my other talk in summary. But that inflammation occurs via a combination of mechanisms that involve oxidation of small, dense LDL particles, are the bad cholesterol one, as well as oxidation of cell membranes and mitochondrial membranes. Oxygen-free radicals are released at every single step of the way, and that equals inflammation in every blood vessel, in every cell, and in every organ of the body. That, infl that inflammation is implicated in modern cancer. It also creates options for treatment along the metabolic pathway. There are multiple sites of intervention. We could cut out the sugar. We could cut out the refined carbohydrates. We could certainly cut out the polyunsaturated oils. We could use antioxidants at multiple sites. Or we could do the lot by cutting out processed food. So let's look at some association evidence. 
What has the food industry given us in the last 50 years? Well, it's convenient processed food. In the 1970s, we saw an increase in uh, sugar consumption. We also increased our refined carbohydrate consumption. And there was a significant increase in our polyunsaturated oil consumption by that purple line, all with a corresponding increase in cancer. Do we have any drug association evidence for the metabolic model of cancer? Well, I think we do. Aspirin is an anti-inflammatory. It's a low-grade one. There are at least 43 randomised controlled trials showing an overall reduction in cancer rates. Metformin is a commonly used drug in diabetes. It reduces tissue levels of glucose. It's associated with a reduced overall cancer rate and mortality. And there's a reduction in cancer risk in diabetic patients to near non-diabetic rates. And it shows generally a slower progress of metastatic disease. Antioxidants are the multiple papers of varying quality. And there appears to be some benefits of antioxidants and eating fresh food. They can work at multiple sites wherever oxidation is occurring. Where they work is actually academic. Vitamins are all involved in inflammation and oxidation. Again, multiple papers vary in quality and it's hard to draw any definitive conclusions. Based on history, certain cultures had no or very little cancer until the introduction of Western food. The Inuit Eskimos, New Guinea natives and our Polynesian neighbours are all seeing Western cancer now. Let's just remember, association evidence is not proof. Do we have any intervention evidence? Well, again, 63 animal studies that show calorie and carbohydrate restriction slows cancer growth, with ketogenic, ketogenic diets being more effective than just calorie restricted. This forest plot, with everything most to the left, shows actually a generalised benefit in ketogenic diets. Do we have any human studies? Well, we do. They're small numbers. They're virtually all on end-stage cancer patients as last-ditch efforts. However, they've been shown to be safe and a stabilisation of disease progress for those that stuck with it. There's at least 15 registered trials in the world looking at ketogenic diets and cancer management. None in Australia. Ketogenic diets are being practised by many patients on an ad hoc basis. Clearly needs more research. In this 2008 study that can't be done on humans, mice were given lethal doses of chemotherapy. The mice in ketosis had a 96% survivorship in comparison to only 34% that were not in ketosis. So I do think nutritional ketosis appears to be effective and protective. Radiotherapy has been shown to have improved outcomes in patients that decreased their carbohydrate intake significantly, <coughs> that also reduced their protein intake and increased their healthy fat consumption. I did a bit of research on miracle cures and miracle treatments. There are some common themes in miracle books. Avoid sugar. They also encourage the power of hope and taking back control. And for those of you that have had cancer, you will know that you lurch from one appointment to the next, one test result to the next. You have no control and little hope. Having a positive attitude actually can help. In this 2010 study, prospective lung cancer study, showed that patients with optimistic personalities had a six-month longer survival. So giving people some control and some hope is actually not a bad thing. So I do think there is an alternate metabolic model of cancer. Our current treatment is based on the chromosomal abnormality. It targets cell duplication. It does work for a lot of people, but the treatment of chemotherapy and radiotherapy is toxic. Current treatment still encourages unrestricted sugar and carbohydrate consumption, particularly in cancer fundraising morning teas, which drive me insane. <laughs> the future treatment, I think, should consider starving cancer of elevated blood glucose, insulin spikes and IGF-1 spikes. I think the future of cancer management is about incorporating ketogenic diets for those 
that shows it. Nutritional ketosis should be bad for cancer cells and protective of cells around cancer. Low carbohydrate and healthy fat living, nutritional ketosis is safe for all ages. We've seen some of that information today. It does improve effectiveness in radiotherapy and chemotherapy in small studies. Ketone bodies are protective to surrounding cells. Does it give the patient some control? Well, well yes. Does it give you some hope? Yes. If it's good enough for treatment, then shouldn't we apply it for prevention? And it's the cheapest treatment of all. So does the genetic model hold up? Well, I don't think so. There is another way to look at cancer based on energy and growth. The Warburg effect and glucose metabolism explain the PET scan. The reverse Warburg effect explains tissue invasion. The metabolic model gives a whole new concept to treatment options with multiple sites of intervention. I think we can make the environment unhealthy for cancer cells to grow. So starving cancer is critical to that. Nutritional ketosis starves the cancer again of glucose and protects the tissue around it. It takes away the insulin and IGF-1 stimulation. A toxic environment makes it harder for cancer to grow. It's not guaranteed to stop it, but it's a good start. So I think we did go the wrong way. I think the microscope did distract us for 100 years. I think chromosomal damage is a marker of cancer and not to blame. It's just there at the scene of the crime. So I challenge you to consider that the primary problem of cancer is dysfunctional glucose metabolism. This opens up a whole new way of managing cancer. It means adding in nutrition to cancer management. I believe that nutritional ketosis has a role to play for those that choose it. It is not about replacing traditional treatments. It's about making surgery, chemotherapy and radiotherapy more effective by sensitising the cancer. It's about protecting the cells around the cancer. It's about cutting back on sugar and processed foods. Patients may very well have some choice in their outcome. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.